Hey everybody, welcome to this week's podcast. There's no special announcements or anything this time, so let's jump right into it. First up, Crix has just released a new firmware for the Mega EverDrive Pro that goes over some bug fixes and performance enhancements. However, it's not as easy to downgrade from this firmware, so unless you are having any of the specific issues listed in the change log, I'm not sure if I would update right away. So let me explain for a little bit. If you have most of the EverDrive carts, all you have to do to change firmwares is just rename the EverDrive directory like .old or something, put the new one on and try it out. And if for whatever reason you want to roll back to the other one, just delete the new directory and then rename the old directory its original name. And that's it. After you reboot when doing that, the cart will just update itself. Uh, and that's all it takes to switch firmwares. So that's why I always say in most cases, just update the firmware and give it a try. If it introduces a new bug into your workflow, then roll it back to the other one. Now you still can roll this one back. It just requires a software tool in order to do it. So it, it shouldn't be a big deal if you do upgrade to this one and then you decide oh you know there's a random bug in my favorite game that no one's discovered with this yet let me bring it back you could still do it it's just not as easy as moving files along on an SD card so I wanted to discuss that not so much because uh, any of the updates are you know giant changes but more just to remind everybody that if you go up to this one you could still downgrade it's just going to be a little bit more work than usual uh, I already upgraded mine though because I have, I have no worries about that and I'm always looking forward to seeing what Crix has added to these and the new firmware works perfect for me. So um, I just wanted to keep everybody in the loop just in case you add this and then wonder, uh oh, how come I can't downgrade? There's an interesting YouTube channel called the Video Game Official Soundtrack Headquarters, whose goal is to get the highest quality music rips from Nintendo 64 games. And they're not quite clear on exactly how they get these rips. They do mention that they, in many cases, work with the original composers and add some kind of enhancements to get what they're calling HD versions of the soundtracks. And they do mention that they're not just rips of CDs with official soundtracks on it, and they're not just basic USF files from emulation, uh, they claim that they're going through a special process in order to get the highest quality sounds possible. So uh, I think it's really interesting, and I'm, I'm always very happy to see preservation type projects like this, but I would love to see a video that chronicles exactly how they do all of this so that people might follow suit and try to make their own. But either way, if you enjoy video game music and you like the songs from Nintendo 64 games, definitely check out the channel and Chris's post. The company Plex has just announced a new feature for their media streaming software that they're calling Plex Arcade that's going to be a $3 a month subscription service that offers two features, uh, one interesting, one not so much. So I'll, I'll skip through the, the easy one. Part of this includes bundled games from Atari 2600, uh, which is totally useless in my opinion. No one cares about a $3 a month service to play the same games that all the other $3 a month services offer that you can get for free on your cell phone. I'm not sure why they wasted the time and money of partnering with Atari on that. Uh, so in my opinion, when you're um, listening to and reading about this project, I would ignore that part altogether because most people listening to this podcast are going to go, I'm not spending $3 a month for, you know, the same five Atari 2600 games I've bought a million times already. However, the other side of it is actually pretty interesting. Through this software, you're allowed to load up your own emulation cores and your own ROMs on your Plex media server. So many of us have Plex servers that we also use as NAS devices that are essentially just older computers that we've now repurposed as NAS devices and purchased newer computers. And in that scenario, you often end up with a pretty decently powerful computer, especially for emulation. And the way this would work is that the entire emulating of the game would happen on the Plex server. And then they use the very awesome Parsec software in order to get that on target devices. Now, I interviewed the Parsec team a couple of years ago, and I was absolutely impressed with what they had to do, uh, or with what they had done. And I've also seen it in action, especially recently through some of the, you know, no more in-person arcade tournaments for a while longer. So people needed to get some of these retro tournaments done in the cloud. And one of the most impressive ones was using Amazon Web Services cloud server and having people connect with Parsec. So each of the clients all connect to the server. So nobody has 
the latency advantage. And it was so quick that it was decent enough for pro gamers to run a tournament. And in local networks like this would probably be used for, it's so quick that in Parsec's own testing, because they are able to grab the information before it hits the video buffer of your computer, they were able to use a high-speed camera to prove that on their target device, they were able to get a picture at the same time as the source device, which is really impressive. Now, of course, there's back and forth talk. It has to process your inputs as well as send you the game screen. So realistically, over a local area network, you might have about a frame of lag. Um, of course, it's always recommended that you use a hardwired connection over Wi-Fi. And even if you have a really good internet connection, you might be able to do something like this with two frames of lag. So thinking about it from that perspective, especially if you're able to integrate any of the new features like run ahead or anything like that, you could really potentially have a very low lag emulation solution that you configure on your Plex server and then you play it on your Apple TV, your cell phone with a Bluetooth controller, although you know all of that stuff adds its own latency. And while it's not really for everybody, I do think people who build their own Plex servers are probably part of the do-it-yourself crowd uh, and they would probably be interested in trying something like this. There is a free trial. Uh, I haven't signed up yet because it's just every time there's a seven day free trial, you could bet that I'll play with it for an hour and then not have time. And by the time I get back to it, the trial's over. So if I could set aside time to mess with it, then I absolutely will. Um, you know, is this going to replace your dedicated uh, emulation boxes? Is it even going to replace a Raspberry Pi? I don't think so, but it's just a neat and unique feature that I think, while it might not be the best way to play these games, it offers a different kind of experience on it, and it's certainly something that's worth paying attention to, because who knows, it might evolve into something bigger. So if you're even slightly interested in this, please check out the post and the announcement from Plex, and of course, you could just try it yourself. And once again, just ignore... Ignore the bundled games. I don't even know why they did that. Uh, they should have at least gotten some better titles if they were going to try to pretend like it was a service that it's worth subscribing for to get the games that they provided. But who knows? Maybe you could make this into something really awesome with your own ROMs. So here's kind of a huge announcement. Dan and Kristoff, the makers of the DC Digital and the PS1 Digital, as well as the Time Sleuth, and they have their hands in a whole bunch of other awesome projects, have teamed up with Woozle, the Game Boy Advance consoleizer creator, to form a company they're calling Pixel FX. And the first product they will be releasing is an HDMI and RGB mod for the Nintendo 64. And this is going to use all of the typical features that you would expect from a Dan and Kristoff product with some pretty cool new enhancements from Woozle, including some really interesting smoothing options so that you're able to get something like the smoothing of the awesome RetroTINK products with the sharpness of something that's direct 1080p or any of the resolutions between. This mod will also allow you to connect either RGB or component video to the multi-out, making it one mod that takes care of everything. And I spoke to Greg, and I believe he's going to be making a mod that allows for a no-cut installation onto Nintendo 64s as well. So this is pretty huge for a million reasons. Uh, you know, having awesome people in the retro gaming community team up to work on something is always a very fun thing that ends up in something pretty incredible. Uh, but on top of that, the N64 community has been dying for HDMI mods, and Marshall just can't get it done, and I don't know why, because, you know, it's it's easy to judge when you're not in a person's shoes, but at the same time, Marshall has had years to sell Ultra HDMI boards and to get it right, and they're always out of stock. They're impossible to get. It's impossible to get a hold of them, so... If there were ever a need for a new N64 HDMI mod, it's definitely now. And if there was ever a team to do it, it's definitely people that have a proven history of both making amazing products and making sure that they're actually available to purchase, which is, is such a huge thing in, in smaller projects like this. You know, it's, it's much easier to complete a project and build one than it is to do that same thing and scale it up with support, with sales and everything else. So, you know, I, I certainly don't mean this to be an insult towards Marshall. It just, it is what it is. It's not, it's not Pixel FX 
ganging up on somebody and trying to steal their market share. They're they're filling a need for a product that so many people want and can't get. And it looks like they're adding a bunch of really cool enhancements that the original Ultra HDMI does not have. Um, it also looks like this product should be available within a few months, which is pretty impressive. Um, so I'll, we'll obviously keep everybody updated on this. Uh, the time frame is looking like April 2021. And of course, I'll try to get one to do a review. Um, I'll probably do a more basic review. I think anything N64 related is really going to go to Mark from my life in gaming, but I'm still, I still want to take a look at mine. Uh, or I still want to take a look at one myself, do the basic comparisons and, and just introduce it to people. But this one's going to be pretty exciting and I can't wait to see what else they have up their sleeves. Cause if this is their first product, imagine what their second might be. As of last weekend, we now have not one, but two different full case enclosures available for the open source scan converter. Now, as far as I know, before this, the only replacement cases that were commercially available looked just like the originals, but came in some pretty cool different translucent clear colors that a lot of people loved, but a lot of other people still wanted a full case replacement, either for aesthetic purposes to keep dust out or whatever. People just like to have different style cases for their stuff. I certainly do. Um, and of the two, the first one was from Retro Frog, which is Todd from Todd's Nerd Cave. And it's a two piece case that has vent holes in the top and the bottom that allows access to the input buttons through a window in the side. Uh, and overall, just looks like a great choice. The other one is from Greg from Laser Bear, and this design kind of reminded me a bit of his RetroTink 2X Classic case, as it has buttons that sit inside that touch the OSSC's buttons, so it kind of feels like a full enclosure with everything covered. It also has a door that you could pop open to get access to the JTAG port, should you choose to update that way, as opposed to the micro SD card, um, and both have slots for the micro SD in the bottom. So if you were looking for a unique case for your OSSC, or maybe if your case was cracked, definitely take a look at both of these because I like them both and I love the fact, as always, that there's choices. So just pick the one that you think would uh, look better in your setup. And uh, I believe Laser Bear is offering a bunch of different colors now. At the moment, I think Todd's uh, only offering them in black, but new colors would probably be available, available at some point in the future. Furtech just released a new firmware update and the open source files for the Neo SD Loader, which is an optical drive emulator for the Neo Geo CD that could work either in place of or alongside of your original disk drive. Now, when Furtech first talked about this project, he mentioned that he was going to be doing it the same way that he did the virtual tap, and that designing the project, um, selling a few batches of it to recoup costs, and then open sourcing it and kind of just politely walking away from the project, which I've actually referred to doing stuff this way as the Furtech model. Um, that's how the Open MVS is being done, as well as so many other open source projects. And I absolutely love it. I think it's so cool that developers can work on these projects and get feedback from the first run, kind of tweak it and make it even better, make some money out of it so they're not just spending all of their time to give their designs away. And then when they're done with it, kind of say, you know, here's all the data sheets on it. You're welcome to make your own. Here's all of the test data I have. Anything else, you kind of got to figure it out, but here's how I got to where we are now. And I just think that's absolutely awesome. Uh, the firmware update's pretty good too. It adds a bunch of different features and bug fixes. So uh, at this point, if you already own a Neo SD loader, then definitely uh, just update the firmware. And if you were looking to build your own, uh, the files are out there now as well. So thanks very much to Furtech for, uh, for doing projects like this. And I really welcome anybody else who's working on something and on the fence about going open source or not to consider doing something this way. Um, and you know, you don't have to set a time limit on it. People usually like to hear things like, oh, okay, you know, Open MVS is released in January, the files will be out by March or something like that. People like dates, but I mean, I don't think it's unfair to just say, I'm going to sell this until I make my money back and then open source it. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's a year. Uh, but that's just my opinion on that. Either way, I think almost everybody in the retro gaming scene probably agrees that that's a really good way to approach projects. Um, and at the end of the day, when something becomes open source, that's one more step towards making sure that it's preserved and, and people have this stuff available. So thanks again to Furtech. 
Jose Tejada, aka Hotego, has just posted two updates to his Patreon page that I thought were awesome and definitely wanted to share with everybody. I think the first might get everybody the most excited in that he posted the first beta for the CPS2 FPGA core for all Patreon subscribers, and while at the moment it only plays Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, this is a giant step into bringing the entire CPS2 library to FPGA solutions like the Mr. Project, uh, which is is absolutely awesome. The CPS 1 and 2 are both uh, some of the most celebrated arcade platforms, and it's really cool that we were able to play them on things like the Mister now. The other post I wanted to talk about in many ways is much more important, just not as flashy. And Hotego went back and tried to upgrade the accuracy of the CPS 1 and 1.5 cores and was able to improve one section of the DMA code down to 0.0% of a difference to original, which essentially is a near perfect recreation of this one part of the core. So when you're thinking of FPGA cores, envision an arcade board, or if you've never seen one of those, envision a computer motherboard in front of you, and an FPGA core is a recreation of all of that. So by going back and going over each individual piece and trying to improve the accuracy of those, you're able to get an overall more accurate experience, which, I mean, I thought the CPS-1 and 1.5 cores were in pretty amazing shape as is, but to get real archived reproductions of these things in FPGA FPGA form, uh, stuff like this is, is really necessary and really important. So I wanted to talk about both of those things. Um, if you want to learn more about Hotego, uh, absolutely check out the podcast we did together. Some people still get their minds blown when they realize it's a conversation, not an interview. I don't know what to say to that other than I had a great time talking to him and a lot of people seem to enjoy it. Um, and if you like his work at all and you have the ability to support, please consider signing up for his Patreon because I think with a lot of these developers that allows them to kind of take this stuff a little bit further. And of course, if you're not in the position to support at the moment, all of Hotego's stuff is eventually made public and he works very quickly. So totally cool if you're not in the position to support at the moment, but if you are, uh, you know, definitely check out the list of the Mr. Developers that you use their stuff the most because I think it's a really cool gesture to even throw the minimum a month uh, and, and really support people making these incredible enhancements. Modern Vintage Gamer just posted a video talking about the history of NES emulation, and if you're just even slightly interested in the subject and don't know anything about the history, it's still a great video to watch, and I highly recommend it. But anybody that grew up using these emulators, definitely give this thing a watch because uh, you'll absolutely get a very weird shot of nostalgia when you see INES and Nesticle running on an old CRT PC like this. Uh, it, it was a very cool video and it really went back and showed what it took to get a lot of these things working. And uh, it reminded me a lot of the original emulation scene. And, and in fact, my first website ever was the Emulatorium, which was a website in like 95 or 96 or something that that um, kept everybody in the loop of enhancements in the uh, in the emulation scene for stuff like this. So essentially, that means I haven't grown up. But <laughs> uh, either way, it was a, a very cool video. I enjoyed the hell out of it. And it was fun to listen to also the history of Marat Faisalin because I recently interviewed him and I'd been following his work since I was a kid. So it was pretty cool to hear that, um, hear that being spoke about in MVG's video. If you want to hear the interview I did with Marat, uh, it's available as an audio only podcast and on YouTube, but it's no video. It's just audio. So just listen, to whatever is the most preferred method for you. But either way, check out MVG's video because I thought it was really cool. Here's a warning to all GameCube fans. There is now a fake GC loader out there that does not work and it is a complete scam. Which, to make matters even more ridiculous, the real GC loader is currently in stock and available directly from Dan, so there's no reason to stumble across this anyway. And I'll go back and explain what's up with this in a second, but this is a perfect time to politely remind people that if you're going to buy stuff like this, you know, smaller projects in the retro gaming world, buy them directly from the people that make them 
or through reputable resellers. And, you know, I'm not trying to say only go with the stores that have been around for a million years. There are stores that have popped up within a few months and people immediately recognize the person running them. It cares about their customers. They're not scamming anybody. It does not take much to be called a reputable reseller. Um, and I mean that in a nice way. You know, it just, it just takes decent customer service and not selling scam or clone products. And now you're a reputable re reseller. So for stuff like this, don't ever find anything off AliExpress, um, you know, or or an eBay seller that's trying to sell their personal used one, quote unquote, but they suddenly have 10 in stock. Like there's some pretty big red flags when you're buying stuff like this. So please always check in with your original developers before going into any of this stuff. Uh, but to explain exactly what this is, someone cloned the hardware of the GC loader. They're calling it the GC loader light. And they also cloned the European distributor of the GC loader, which I believe they're no longer selling. So, but it's still a clone of their website. And the big difference is it doesn't actually work. It doesn't load games. It is able to load Swiss. So in their instructions, what they're telling people to do is open their GameCube, um, take out the DVD drive after removing the 900 screws, holding all that stuff in, replace it with this, and then get either a memory card reader or an SD to SP2 to actually boot games from. So this fake GC loader only boots to Swiss which is the same exact thing that you could do by just buying an action replay disc and a memory card reader, which does not involve opening your GameCube at all. And with a lot of the GC loaders out there, you can get GameCube replacement drives fairly cheap. So even if, if yours is dead, it would be pretty easy to swap one out with an actual disc drive or, you know, just buy a real GC loader if you wanted to. So uh, the, the things to look out for is GC loader light. Their website is slightly different than the European one, but uh, I, they're not selling them at the moment. So if it's not Black Dog Tech, it's not an official reseller at this point. And the other thing is the mention of the SD to SP2 and the SD Gecko and stuff like that. Now, they very deliberately badly word this stuff to confuse people because there is a scenario in which you would use the real GC loader with a memory card reader or the SD to SP2. And that's at the moment for people that need to write back to the SD card. So if you're just playing homebrew and you're just playing your game backups, there's no need for it at all. But if you want to have specific settings in Swiss saved, then yes, at the moment you need some other external SD card support for it. Um, hopefully at some point that will be integrated directly into the GC loader, but that's why they're able to kind of do the play on words. So the GC loader light requires it because it doesn't work because it's a fake scam. And the real GC loader doesn't require anything extra, but you could add on if you want extra features or a second SD card. I could imagine that might be helpful for people that want to put a small SD inside their GameCube, you know, or an affordable one and then swap out SDs from the bottom whatever. There's a million reasons why you might want to use that for legitimate reasons, but it is not required. So those are the things to look out for. Um, I really hope whoever did this doesn't sell a single one and loses all their money because that's what you get for scamming. And if you're somebody with uh, questionable morals who would be willing to save a few dollars by basically stealing from the original developer, you're going to get something that doesn't work and I'm not going to have any sympathy for you because you should have known better. <laughs> I mean, it's a mean thing. I'm sure I'm going to get flamed in the comments for this, but it's, it's the truth. Buying and supporting clones is awful. There has been, out of the entire time I've run retro RGB and in the entire time I've been involved in the retro gaming world, which I was since before it was retro, there's been one or two times where I've ever willingly used a clone and they were really extremely extreme situations. Uh, and even then I kind of still felt bad, but it's, that's an extreme situation. This is not, this is the GC loaders are real. They're in stock. They're available to buy. They work great. There's no reason to stumble across a fake one. Uh, and there's certainly no reason for somebody to have tried to clone it. So, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what else to say about it. Check out the post uh, if you'd like. If they take down the website, I saved PDFs of everything just to prove that they actually did it. And they, strangely enough, left a um, 
an email address on the website. Who knows what that leads to? But yeah, don't buy fakes. Don't buy clones. Please just check in with your original developers for this stuff. Well, that's it for this week. As always, thanks so much to everybody that watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments, and especially thanks to everybody that supports in any way. The monthly support services are the most helpful, but anything at all is amazing, including just going to retrorgb.com forward slash support, clicking on an Amazon or eBay link, and buying whatever else you were going to buy for the same price you were going to buy it for, but we get like a fraction of a penny for every sale. So even that is a giant help and all of it is super, super appreciated. So thank you all so much and we'll see you next week. <laughs>